All right. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, and we were looking at Matthean authorship. Now we're going to look at subject, some objections uh, that some scholars have raised to Matthean authorship. First of all, we would expect that there would be some vivid, detailed touches that an eyewitness would be able to give. You know, you would expect if Matthew were there, he could give you these little touches, you know, and then Jesus made this gesture, you know. Um, but that's exactly what you don't have in Matthew. In fact, it seems that Matthew has edited out those detailed touches from Mark. Uh, for example, in the uh, record of the feeding of the 5,000, Mark says that the people sat on the green grass. He mentions that the grass was green. When you look at Matthew, he doesn't mention that. So it's just the opposite of what you would expect if it was from an eyewitness. Now, it could be that Matthew wanted to eliminate everything but the essentials in his gospel. And he would only be able to get a limited amount of, of writing on a scroll. So if he wanted to get everything he wanted to write on the scroll, he would have to eliminate something. And it seems that he has chosen to eliminate those perhaps unimportant parts and uh, only focus on what he believes is important. You know, you have five major discourses in Matthew. He wants to be sure to get that. He wants to be sure to include Jesus' ministry of healing and exorcism, and then the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so it may be that he edited out the things, everything, that he didn't feel was all that important. Why would a man like Matthew, an eyewitness, incorporate the book of Mark almost totally in his gospel when Mark was not an eyewitness? Uh, Kumel says that this makes the idea of Matthew writing the gospel impossible. But perhaps Matthew did it out of respect, uh, not for Mark, but for Peter, for whom Mark wrote. Ancient authors regularly uh, borrowed uh, from previous writers. Now, we may call that plagiarism, but it wasn't considered that at that time. So it did not have the taboo that it has today. Matthew already had Mark and perhaps used Mark as the backbone of his gospel and then put in the sayings of Christ, the five discourses, to supplement Mark. So why reinvent the wheel? I mean, Mark had already written this gospel. Why does Matthew feel like he has to start from scratch and that he can't use what uh, Mark has already done? Uh, more than for other gospels, scholars tend to see uh, as the background of Matthew, a community, perhaps a missionary church or a scribal school. And many people conjecture what this community may have been. Um, could it have been Jewish Christian, Greek speaking, persecuted, and so forth. But this is always a precarious venture as we said earlier, communities don't write gospels. Individuals write gospels. The bottom line is that we can't be absolutely sure, uh, but there seems to be really good evidence that Matthew was the author of this gospel, and it should be accepted. Remember, in the early church, no one questioned whether or not Matthew wrote it, and nobody else suggested that somebody else wrote it. So there's good external evidence for that. Oh, do you have any questions about the authorship of Matthew? All 
All right, let's go to the date. Here are some factors that we need to consider when we uh, arrive at the date of Matthew. The gospel itself seems to suggest that a considerable period of time has elapsed between the events of the gospel and the writing of the book. Phrases such as, to this day, or to this very day, seem to make the point that in spite of the fact that a lengthy period of time had taken place, uh, what is being talked about uh, still continues. Describing the purchase of the field uh, with Judas's blood money, Matthew says, that, it is, that is why it is called the field of blood to this day. So, and also in telling the soldiers uh, to spread the story that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body while he slept, Matthew says, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So that uh, seems like it's surprising that that is still continues when the gospel is being written. Another important indication of the time uh, in which it was written is the fact that it deals with issues that were prominent in later decades, particularly Christian-Jewish tensions. Some of the accounts of the book seemed uh, aimed at countering attacks by the Jews. The birth narrative could have been aimed at the Jewish claim that Jesus was illegitimate. The account of the Roman guard at Jesus' tomb could be to counter the Jewish claim that Jesus' body was stolen by his disciples. Secondly, we also know that Matthew used the Gospel of Mark in his Gospel, so we need some time for the Gospel of Mark to have been written and then for Matthew to have gotten a copy of that and then written his gospel. It has to be before AD 100 because of Ignatius, Ignatius's use of it. Perhaps we should posit a date of somewhere between 50 and 80 for the, uh, the date of Matthew. All right. Questions? Okay, the place. The place where Matthew is written is uncertain. Antioch is as good a conclusion as any. Um, the Jewish outlook suggests Palestine or Syria. Let me just make a note here. Although the fact uh, that the audience was Greek-speaking Greek may rule out Palestine. Many Christians from Palestine had migrated to Antioch. We also see its concern for Gentiles also suggests the church in Antioch where many Gentiles were in the church. And thirdly, Ignatius the Bishop of Antioch in the second quarter of the second century is the first witness to the Gospel of Matthew. So all of that is evidence for Antioch, although we cannot be sure. What is the purpose of the Gospel of Matthew? Let me go back up. Um, Carson and Moose suggest several topics uh, for Matthew that Matthew wanted to emphasize, although they don't come to one specific uh, purpose. Gundry says that Matthew's purpose was to strengthen the Christian Jews in their suffering of persecution, to warn them against laxity and apostasy, and to urge them to use their persecution as an opportunity for the evangelism of all nations. He entitles this chapter, Matthew, 
handbook for a mixed church under persecution. So a mixed church would be part Jew, part Gentile, but uh, under persecution. And it would be assumed that this persecution is from the Jewish community. Uh, Kummel concludes that the purpose of Matthew is to defend Christianity and to make it acceptable to Jewish Christian readers and to prove Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. He says that the goal of Matthew is to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi, and the salvation comes only through the Church of Christ. So in this way, Matthew serves as a bridge between the Old Testament and the church. So Matthew is the only gospel that mentions the church. He quotes the Old Testament many times. And so both of those factors together uh, show that Matthew is a bridge document, bridging the Old Testament with the church in the New Testament. Carson and Moo give the following uh, as to what Matthew wants to prove. Uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, Emmanuel, the one to whom the Old Testament points. Secondly, uh, many Jews did not recognize Jesus. The promised kingdom has already been inaugurated. Those of the Messianic community constitute the true people of God in the world. And number five, the Messianic reign of Christ will be consummated at his return. Um, let me at this point just do something that is not in my notes here, but I think it's something that um, is important, and this is probably a good place to share it. going to make a little diagram here. This is the Jewish view of history. Here comes Namge. Uh, I apologize for my terrible handwriting here. It's really hard on this, this screen. But the, the Jews of Jesus' day saw time divided into two ages, this age and the age to come. This age in which we are now living is characterized by sin, by death, by pain, by war, by sickness, by all the things that really get us down in this age, you know, that we have to deal with. But they saw God coming in, intervening in history. And this would happen on the day of the Lord. Well, I just accidentally hit the clear button. And 
And when God intervenes in history, he will change this entire world. He will put the son of David on the Messiah's throne. He will usher in righteousness. There will be judgment for the sinners. And uh, those who are righteous will enter the kingdom. So in place of sickness, there will be health. In place of war, there will be peace. In place of sin, there will be forgiveness. And uh, it will be a time of peace. And uh, it was what the Old Testament was looking for, the day of the Lord. Now, when Christ came, and I will signify that by a cross here, this is what we would call the Christ event, the birth, ministry, death, and resurrection of Christ. The kingdom of God was established, but only in a preliminary kind of way. It was not here in its fullness. The book of Hebrews says that we have tasted the powers of the age to come. So we uh, experience healing, but we still also experience sickness. We experience forgiveness, and yet we still sin. We experience God's peace, and yet there is still war. We experience eternal life, and yet there is still death. So we are living in the tension between this age and the age to come. And this has been called the already, not yet. Now, this is important for us to understand New Testament theology. This tension is there in the Gospels, in the Epistles, all the way through. The kingdom has come, and yet not in its fullness. It will come in its fullness at Christ's second coming. And instead of it simply being the day of the Lord, it is now the day of the Lord Jesus. So here we are now. We are in this tension between this age and the age to come. We need to take both of these ages seriously. You know, there are those who say there should be no sickness, no problems. It's all the age to come. <laughs> but, you know, we're still very much in this age. And, uh, but we shouldn't let this age dominate us because we have entered into the kingdom. So we are already kingdom members. So we live in the tension between the already and the not yet. Uh, any questions here? Comments? All right. Hey, sir. Uh, yes. Hey, sir, therefore, the perfection is in the age to come. That's why there's no, um, how can I say, there's no uh, full, full of, let's say, um, totally totally fullness here on earth that but the fullness is right up there on the age to come or that's the perfection. right that's right we've tasted the powers of the age to come and so we experience uh, much of what the age to come is going to bring but it's not here in its fullness it will come when christ returns that's why, sir, uh, so that we won't settle on earth just for us to desire heaven because we're, we're, we're only uh, foreigners of this, on this ground, but we're citizens of heaven. We are, and, yes. Yes. Um, now, we need to realize when we talk about heaven is, you know, Jesus said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, when we die, we go to heaven. But our eternal existence is not going to be in heaven. It's going to be on earth. 
the city of God descends from heaven to earth, the new Jerusalem. And so we will be earth-dwelling people for eternity. We will have resurrection bodies, okay? We will not be spirits floating around, you know? We won't be sitting on clouds, wearing white robes, playing harps with a halo. We're gonna be very much uh, in this, this earth, but not in this age. It's gonna be a renewed earth. It's gonna be a redeemed earth, as Paul says in Romans chapter eight. Our bodies are going to be spiritual, but that doesn't mean that they're immaterial. They are going to be material bodies uh, energized by the spirit. Okay, any other questions or comments here? All right, we'll go back to the other screen share. Welcome, Namge. Oh, thank you. All because right. Of the internet, I'm late. Okay, we understand what that's like. All right, let us go to the characteristics of the book of Matthew. Uh, one of the main emphases of Matthew is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Let us just look at, at some of these. Christ's birth is fulfilled. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. His birthplace. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And all of these places are specifically, we are specifically told, are fulfillments of the Old Testament. What was written by the prophet. And... Um, so this is a major characteristic of Matthew, a major emphasis. And like I said, it's closely tied to the Old Testament, but Matthew's also tied to the church, that bridging factor there. So very often the Old Testament quotation is prefaced by something like, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. Okay. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. So can I, since I'm writing my uh, Trump paper on uh, Matthew authorship, can, mm -hmm. can I also pick some of the things from here and write from your teaching? Uh, you can, yes. Okay. Uh, you will want, I would think that you would want to uh, get second sources. Okay. You know, on what you use from the lecture okay. and, and not just use it from the lecture. Yeah. Okay. You need to keep me honest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Matthew has a strongly Jewish flavor. The teaching on God's kingdom and righteousness are Jewish concerns that are highlighted in Matthew. He also deals with uh, current issues in Judaism, external acts of piety, love of recognition, proselytizing, and so forth. So uh, Matthew is a very Jewish gospel. Jesus is portrayed as a greater Moses. Like Moses, Jesus gives part of his law from a mountain. And the number of his discourses is five, the same number of the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. 
but there is also an interest in Gentiles. Now, this is surprising since Matthew emphasizes Jesus' ministry to Israel first. But at the beginning of Matthew, the Magi from the east come and worship Jesus, and at the end, Matthew gives the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So when we say that it has a strongly Jewish flavor, we don't want to imply that there's no interest for, uh, in Gentiles. Uh, there certainly was. And uh, all of us know the Great Commission, and that comes from Matthew. Matthew has more teaching by Jesus than either of the other synoptics. So we have, as I said, we have five major discourses in Matthew, each ending with the phrase, when Jesus had finished. When Jesus had finished saying these things, when Jesus had finished, etc. Um, and that is a, a key to the uh, the structure of the book. The church is dealt with by name only in Matthew. In fact, Matthew is sometimes called the gospel of the church. In 1618, Jesus said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And in 1817, Jesus said, tell it to the church. So this is the only mention of the church in the Gospels. And you know, because of that, the connection with the Old Testament, the connection with the church, we see Matthew as a bridge gospel here. We see an emphasis on the kingdom of God, or as Matthew usually calls it, the kingdom of heaven, and the royal nature of God and Christ. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is the same thing as the kingdom of God. The Jews would hesitate to use the word God, lest they take the name of the Lord in vain. And so... As a substitute, they would say heaven, and that's what we have most of the time in Matthew. Matthew gives us the virgin birth of Jesus from the standpoint of Joseph. Think of the infancy narrative. The emphasis is on Joseph. The angels speak to Joseph. Joseph makes the decision of where they are going to live. And uh, so it's from Joseph's standpoint. Uh, do you have any questions or comments here so far? Hi, sir. Yes, Ruel. Uh, sir, you mentioned about the Jewish playboy, uh, specifically in the Great Commission, the book of Matthew. And compare with Luke in the book, uh, Gospel of Luke, with this uh -huh. Great Commission is different. Mm hmm Different with matches here because Luke is more of about he mentioned about wait to the Jerusalem to to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, yes, Luke actually gives us two great commissions, uh, one in Luke and one in Acts one eight, and um, but the fullest description of the great commission is in Matthew. Okay. I thought this story is just like Luke it has his own intention of because of his focus with the Holy Spirit. That's why he's more into that area. Uh, possibly so. I'm uh, just thinking like that, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. I think so. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Let's look at the content then of Matthew. As we look at the content, we see that there are five major discourses, and this alternates between narrative and discourse. So in 1, 1 to 425, 
we have narrative. Christ's birth, uh, the uh, baptism, the temptation, and then we have the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 to 7. Then we have narrative, and then the second discourse, the missionary discourse. More narrative, and then the parables of the kingdom discourse. More narrative, and then we have the Messiah's community discourse, and then more narrative, and then the discourse, the Jewish leaders, and the end of the world. This is, uh, you know, in Jerusalem, uh, when they see the temple, and Christ says, not one stone's going to be left on another. And then that is followed by narrative, which is uh, the Lord's Supper, the trial, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. So, um, so we have the five discourses interspersed with narrative. Kumal gives the following simple outline. We have prologue in 1, 1 to 4, 16. Chapters 1 and 2, Jesus' names and places of origin of Jesus. And 3, 1 to 4, 11, preparation for the activity of Jesus. And then two parts. Part 1, the proclamation of the kingdom of God in Galilee. And then part 2, Jesus on the way to Jerusalem and the predictions of the passion. And then the conclusion is the passion narrative and the resurrection. Now, one thing that we are going to notice is that all three of the synoptic gospels have basically the same outline. They all come from that Markan framework. Matthew and Luke diverge from Mark from time to time, but basically they follow Mark's order. Here's the outline from um, Merrill Tinney, his New Testament survey, uh, which is almost identical with that of Carson and Moo. Uh, number one, the prophecies of the Messiah realized. Now, you are going to realize that Tinney must have been a preacher because of the alliteration here, all the P's. So we have Jesus' genealogy, birth, baptism, and temptation. Number two, the principles of the Messiah announced, the Sermon on the Mount. Number three, the power of the Messiah revealed, miracles and the commissioning of the Twelve. Four, the program of the Messiah explained, teaching about John the Baptist and the giving of the parables. Five, the purpose of the Messiah declared, John the Baptist is beheaded, and Jesus predicts the cross and teaches on the obligation of discipleship. Six, the problems of the Messiah presented. Jesus answers questions of his opponents and gives a lengthy discourse on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the end of the age. Seven, the passion of the Messiah accomplished. The Last Supper, Jesus' betrayal, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. And then the epilogue the report of the guards, and the Great Commission. Now, we need to change the epilogue to something starting with a P so that we can have the P's uh, in every one of these. But uh, that is Tinney's outline of Matthew. Major passages that are unique to Matthew, that is, it appears only in Matthew and not in any of the other Gospels. The Matthean infancy narratives from Joseph's viewpoint uh, is unique to Matthew. It appears nowhere else. Several sections of the Sermon on the Mount are unique to Matthew. Uh, several parables of the kingdom in chapter 13 we find only in Matthew. The parable of the unmerciful servant also only appears in Matthew. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard, the parable of the two sons, the parable of the ten maidens, and the teaching about the last judgment. The death of Judas only appears in Matthew. 
the guard at the tomb, the bribing of the soldiers, and the Great Commission. These are parts of Matthew that appear only in Matthew. There are also what we call stereotyped transitions. After the major discourses of Christ, we have the phrase, when Jesus had finished. In 7, 28 to 29, this is after the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things. 11, 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples. 1353, when Jesus had finished these parables. Uh, 19, 1, when Jesus had finished saying these things. And 26, 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things. Now, some scholars divide Matthew by temporal transitions. From that time on, Jesus began to. So, in 417, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And in 1621, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day uh, be raised to life. So from that time on, Jesus began to preach. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the first major part of Jesus' ministry. And then in 1621, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples what was going to happen in Jerusalem, this happens right after Caesarea Philippi, where Peter confesses, you are the Christ. So that begins the second major part of uh, Matthew, of Jesus' ministry. If you use these transitions then as stru structural markers, uh, you can see how it's laid out. The third part would be comprised of Jesus' journey to uh, Jerusalem, passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. So the, the first part would be before uh, Matthew 4.17. The infancy narratives, the uh, baptism, temptation of Christ. And then the part two starting at Matthew 4.17, part three starting at 16.21. All right, do you have questions or comments on Matthew? Okay, if not, let us move along. Okay, we will uh, start the Gospel of Mark, and um, I tell you what, it's time for a break. So let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and uh, get into Mark. All right, so have a good break. Okay, sir. Uh, sorry, sir, I need to turn off my camera because... Uh... All right, we are looking now at the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, for the vast majority of church history, has been the most neglected of all the Gospels. No commentary on Mark is known until the 6th century, and none after that until the 9th. It was completely overshadowed by Matthew, because many believe that it was just a condensation of Matthew, that was the Augustinian and the Griesbach hypotheses. But in recent years, since the conception of source criticism and the chronological priority of Mark, 
it has been given a lot of attention. The importance of Mark cannot be overestimated. Mark was the first gospel, and it was the pattern for Matthew and Luke. We don't know if any gospels existed before Mark. So when Mark was written, he was breaking new ground. You know, being the first to do something isn't like being the second. Who flew the first airplane? Who can tell me? Who flew the first airplane? I'm sure somebody here knows that. Not necessarily. Nobody knows that. Okay. It was the Wright brothers. Uh, generally, when I ask that question, somebody knows. And then I ask, who flew the second airplane? And nobody knows. Because it's the one who does the, the breakthrough action that is important. Until then, it has never been done. Who was the first to step on the moon? Who was the first person? Who can tell me that? I'm strong, sir. Neil Armstrong. All right. Neil Armstrong was. Strong. And Buzz Aldrin was there with him. Who then were the next people to stand on the moon? Probably none of us know. Okay. It's, it's that one that has done what nobody else had done before that is so important. Well, that is Mark. Mark is the first gospel. And so uh, it's incredibly important what he did. Now, let's look at Mark in terms of our seven questions of introduction. First of all, authorship. Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately. Uh, this is a quote from Papias. Mark became Peter's interpreter and wrote accurately all that he remembered, not indeed in order of the things said or done by the Lord. He had not heard the Lord, nor had he followed him, but later on, as I said, followed Peter, who used to give teaching as necessity demanded, but not making, as it were, an arrangement of the Lord's oracles, so that Mark did nothing wrong in thus writing down single points as he remembered them. So the first testimony about Mark comes from Papias, uh, who lived from about A.D. 60 to about A.D. 130. And this quote uh, is a quote from Eusebius quoting Papias. Now, some scholars doubt the uh, accuracy of Papias's uh, information. But as Paul Anderson has said, if Papias were wanting to bolster Mark's contents uncritically, why mention that they were not preserved in order? Also, why mention that Paul had not heard the Lord? If this was fabricated, why not locate Mark close to Jesus as an eyewitness? I think the Petrine references are therefore modest and not overestimated or overstated. Uh, other early church fathers attest to Mark's authorship. Irenaeus, the Muratorian Canon, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Jerome. All of them attribute the Gospel of Mark to Mark and connect it with Peter. But we must ask the question, is this Mark the John Mark of the book of Acts? Although some have denied it, it seems almost certain that the two people are the same. Who was John Mark? Well, he was the cousin of Barnabas 
as Paul tells us in Colossians 4.10. Uh, in Acts, we see that when Peter was delivered from prison, he went to the home of Mary, John Mark's mother. From that, we get the impression that his home may have been a central meeting place for the leaders of the Jerusalem church. It may even be the house where the upper room was located, the upper room of the Last Supper, the upper room where the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples. So Mark was probably from the upper class. In Acts 12, 25, when Paul and Barnabas uh, came from Jerusalem to Antioch, they took John Mark with them, and he went with, with them on uh, the, their first missionary journey. But along the way, he quit and went back home. When they were going to begin their second missionary journey, who can tell me what happened? Who can tell me what happened when Paul and Barnabas were getting ready to go on their second missionary journey? Barnabas uh, wanted sir. to... <laughs> go ahead, Moon. Uh, Barnabas wanted to bring Mark uh, together with them, but um, Paul didn't agree. So Barnabas and Paul are separated. Is that right, Doctor? That is right. That is exactly right. Um, there was so much contention between Barnabas and Paul that Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus. Paul took Silas and went into Asia Minor. Now, you know, this was not one of Paul's greater moments. Paul, who speaks of unity and getting along, you know, um, really didn't do, to do too great a job at it himself. Put yourself in John Mark's place. How would you feel? How would you feel if the greatest evangelist of the church, the Apostle Paul, rejected you? Now, we aren't told why he rejected Mark, but I assume that it was because uh, they deserted him or he deserted them on the first missionary journey. And Paul said he's not going to do it again. He did it once. That's enough. Um, so Paul wasn't going to give him a second chance. How do you think you would feel? Zompi, how do you think you would feel? You're muted. No there you go. Zompi? Yes. How do you think you would feel if you were John Mark? And Paul said, I don't want this kid going with us. Uh, I have no idea, sir. No idea, huh? What about the rest of you? How would you feel? Sir, I feel sad, sir. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Like a rejection, sir. maybe? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So do I, sir. Very embarrassed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what a devastating sir, or, blow. Yeah, disappointed, sir. Okay. Disappointed because he couldn't go, but probably more than that even. Feeling bad about himself. You know? Mm -hmm. I, uh, no, yes, sir. yes, Maybe. rejected. Mm, rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. we... Go ahead. Mm. Yeah, maybe I will feel uh, I'm confident and I'm capable to do uh, to do to to do evangelize because uh, the great 
uh, evangelist denied me. So maybe I feel upset and disappointed. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I don't know if Paul yeah. said, hey, uh, guy. My you're... explanation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, what the the main the main uh, reason uh, say John Pao uh, or Pao uh, not bring uh, who well ago uh, Silas Silas mm -hmm. are you asking Paul bring why? Silas uh, Paul bring Silas right mm -hmm. what the main reason why why uh, Paul uh, doesn't agree with uh, well, good Barnabas, eh, Barnabas, right? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Well, John Mark had deserted them. You know, they got up to Asia Minor, and John John Mark left. He went back to Jerusalem, and I don't know if he said, you know, this missionary stuff is not for me. I'm going home to mama. I don't know what happened. Um, but Paul took that, I believe, as being a negative thing, and he didn't want it to happen again. So he said, John Mark, you're not going. No way. And um, so, yes, he then took Silas, and they went on what we call Paul's second missionary journey. Okay. Um, sir. Um, yes. Sir, do you think he's not fit? <clears throat> Maybe because, do you think he, John Paul is not fit during the second missionary journey or maybe because of health reason? No. Well, he was okay to go to Cyprus. He went to Cyprus with Barnabas and it seems like they probably had a missionary uh, campaign there. So it, I don't think it was a physical thing that no, kept no, John certain. Mark. Yeah, yeah. Something more than that. Uh, something, something, something else. Oh, like, yeah. Right, right. Um, now, the next time we hear of Mark, he is again working with Paul, as he says in Colossians 4.10 and Philemon 24. So somewhere along the line, John Mark uh, reconnects with Paul. Later on, we see that when Paul is in jail in Rome, he writes to Timothy and asks him to bring to Paul several things. Now, Paul is going to be executed soon. He knows that. He knows he only has a short time to live. Uh, he asks uh, Timothy to bring him several things, the parchments, uh, the books, the uh, cloak that he left with Carpus and Troas, and he asked him to bring a person. And who was that person? Wasn't Peter. Wasn't Barnabas. That person was John Mark. Who did Paul want to be with him in his last hours? It was John Mark that he had rejected years before. He says, he is profitable to me in the ministry. What an affirmation of this young man who had been rejected and now is affirmed by the great Apostle Paul. What greater affirmation could you have than wanting him to be with you in his last hours. Uh, maybe he wanted to pass on the mantle of his ministry to John Mark. John Mark is reinstituted, reinstated uh, in the ministry by the Apostle Paul. So we see here that Barnabas, if you remember from Acts, Barnabas helps Paul. 
when the people in Jerusalem don't really believe that Paul has been converted, Barnabas uh, vouches for him and said, yes, you know, he is a brother now. So Paul, in a sense, uh, owes at least part of his ministry to Barnabas. Now, Barnabas tried to help Mark. Mark failed. Paul refused to help him further. Mark seemingly is a failure, but later Mark is no failure. He is useful to Paul. Okay, so this is sort of the background then of the authorship of the Gospel of Mark. Do you have any other questions or comments here? All right. The place. Where did uh, Mark write this? The most likely place is Rome. Almost all the ancient tradition points to Rome. Uh, some of the evidence. There are Latinisms that give evidence for Rome. By Latinisms, we mean Latin words that are transliterated into the Greek. At times, Mark even explains some Greek terms with Latin ones. Uh, the uh, copper coin, the lepta, is a quadrantes, which was Roman coinage. Uh, he calls the palace where Jesus was tried the praetorium, another Latin word. From the fact that he translates Aramaic phrases, we know that he wasn't writing to people in Palestine. So when, um, when Jesus heals Jairus' daughter, he says, Talitha kum, which is Aramaic for a uh, young girl, rise, and he translates that into Greek for his Greek-speaking audience. So probably Rome. Yeah, that is what is associated with it. Uh, Peter probably did the sermons that Mark uh, took notes on for his gospel in Rome. In terms of date, uh, some of the tradition about Mark's writing of the gospel says that he wrote during the lifetime of Peter. Uh, this was Clement of Alexandria that said that. Some, such as Irenaeus, said that he wrote after Peter's death. Of course, it could have been that Mark began writing while Peter was still alive and finished his writing after Peter died. At any rate, we can probably say that it was written around A.D. 64, or sometime before A.D. 64. Uh, Gundry dates it uh, sometime between 45 and 60. Now, 45 seems a little bit too early for me. Uh, you have to allow for Mark's association with Peter. So that's, that's going to be some time there. So I think 45 is too, uh, too soon. Now, there are scholars who say it had to have been written after AD 70 uh, when the temple fell into the hands of the Romans because of Jesus' prophecies in Mark 13 about the destruction and desecration of the temple. But what those critics presuppose is that Jesus could not have accurately predicted the future. They say that since he couldn't, Mark must have written those things after the fact, and therefore what he wrote must have been written after AD 70. Okay, do you, are you following me there? What's wrong with that kind of reasoning?
What's wrong with saying it had to have been, been written after AD 70 because Jesus uh, so graphically described the fall of Jerusalem and the temple? Is there anything wrong with that reasoning? Maybe I think because without a, a concrete proof, I think we shouldn't be, because maybe because of the concrete proof, we, there is no as such concrete proof, I think. Okay. okay. Ex explanation. Okay, okay. Was Jesus able to predict what was going to happen before it happened? All right. That then, if, if Jesus had that kind of knowledge, then that destroys that argument, doesn't it? Jesus could, during his lifetime, in the A.D. 30s, have said what he said, and uh, then it came true in AD 70. So Jesus correctly prophesied about what would happen in Jerusalem. Another bit of evidence for the date of Mark is that Luke used Mark. Now, when did Luke write? It seems that Luke completed Acts around 64. At least that's what I believe. If so, Mark would have been, had had to have been written uh, before AD 64. And then Mark would have been written. And then the Gospel of Luke would have been written. And then Acts would have been written. And it seems like Acts was completed around AD 64. So um, that also would give us some evidence about when Mark was written. Mark, then Luke, then Acts. Okay? The purpose. Why did Mark write his gospel? What purpose lies behind this? Now, during the first quest for the historical Jesus, Mark was seen as the pure, unadulterated, uh, non-theological gospel. Since then, it's been uh, noted that Mark is a, really a very theological gospel. In fact, some scholars uh, say that Mark is the most theologically sophisticated of the Gospels. Now, very few introductions or articles deal with the question of Mark's purpose. They have readings labeled purpose or the like, but they never really come out and say this or that was Mark's purpose in writing. Gundry says, first of all, that his purpose was to bring non-Christians to faith in Christ. But there was a particular background against which Mark writes. Gundry says that he writes to counteract the shame of the manner in which Christ died. To counteract the shame of the manner in which Christ died. He was crucified, and that was the death of a criminal, like, I don't know what kind of execution you have in your country, uh, but in America, it would be like the electric chair, uh, where people commit murder and they are executed. Uh, they would do it normally in a electric chair, <coughs> or they may do it by needle injection, or they may do it by firing squad, uh, guns, you know, aimed at the person. It was not a glorious thing at all. In fact, you could not even mention crucifixion or the cross 
in polite company. Who would believe in a man who died like that? To counteract this, according to Gundry, Mark stresses the power of Christ to perform miracles and especially to rise from the dead. Certainly, it would seem Mark wants to present Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and the Son of Man. I believe that he also uh, wants to show the need for commitment uh, to Christ in terms of discipleship. Carson and Moose say that Mark's purpose involved letting his readers know who Jesus was, the suffering Son of God, and what is reveal or what is involved in real discipleship. Believers also must suffer. Let's look at some of the characteristics of Mark. Number one, Mark is a gospel of action. It uses terse, abrupt language and moves quickly from scene to scene. As a fast-moving plot, it draws quickly to a climax. And this is illustrated by the repeated use of the word immediately. Immediately, this happened. Immediately, that happened. Immediately, the next thing happened. So it's a fast-moving plot there. It's a gospel of action. Uh, in fact, uh, one uh, evangelical writer wrote a commentary on Mark, and it was entitled, Where the Action Is. Well, there's a lot of action in Mark. Mark records personal reactions. 23 times there are descriptions such as amazed, astonished, afraid, and so forth. At times, even Jesus' gestures, his, his hand movements, are uh, recorded. Number three, Mark is a vivid gospel, showing that it is the testimony of an eyewitness. Now, Mark himself was not an eyewitness, but he's writing for Peter, and Peter was an eyewitness. Uh, remember, we mentioned that he uh, noted that the 5,000 people sat on the green grass. Eyewitness. Mark is bluntly honest concern, concerning Jesus and others in his gospel. He tells about the disciples' lack of understanding. Uh, think of all the times when Jesus say, says, uh, are you so slow that you can't understand? Um, also, Jesus' relatives' lack of understanding. His family thinks he's mad, crazy. Mark tells us of Jesus' amazement. Jesus was amazed at certain things that happened. Also, his inability to work miracles because of people's unbelief. And um, also, he tells us that Jesus was angry. So, um, these are things that the other Gospels do not emphasize the way Mark does. Mark puts an emphasis on the passion and resurrection of Christ. That is over 40% of the gospel. So over 40% of Mark's gospel is about Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Mark shows Jesus as the Son of God. Um, he acts in power. In 1 1, 1 11, and 15 39. He also tells us that Jesus is the Son of Man. And he tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. The Son of Man, um, 
let me just say a word about these two things, son of God and son of man. You have probably heard people say, Jesus as the son of God shows that he was divine. And Jesus as the son of man shows that he was human. Okay, you've probably heard that. I think we need to rethink that to some extent. Because the son of God, uh, that phrase at times applies to humans. The king was the son of God. Um, and uh, the Messiah, uh, when uh, in Matthew, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he, in a sense, equates the Messiah, the one who sits on David's throne, the king, with the Son of God. So it could be that in that instance, Matthew is not saying you're the, you're the second person of the Trinity. Okay? Now, Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7, where it talks about a heavenly Son of Man who sits on God's throne and is worshipped alongside God. So this is a divine figure. So it's not simply that Son of God means Jesus is divine and Son of Man means he's human. It's more complicated than that. And the, the phrase Son of Man is a very exalted uh, description of who Jesus is. It shows him as the Redeemer. Mark tells us that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Luke Timothy Johnson points out that Mark uses patterns of three. There are three seed parables, three popular opinions about John, three popular opinions about Jesus, three predictions about the passion, three failures of the disciples to stay awake in the garden, and three denials of Jesus by Peter. But this is also uh, present on a larger dimension. Mark will tell a story and insert into it another story forming three parts. Uh, this is called intercalation. Intercalation, or as some people call it, a Markin sandwich. You own a sandwich, you have a piece of bread, then you have the meat, and then you have another piece of bread. The meat is in there between the two pieces of bread, you know, so that's a sandwich. Some people calls, call this a Markin sandwich. Uh, for example, in Mark 3, 20 to 35, let me just, just read this to you. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And then starting at verse 22, the next verse, and the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem and said, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. 
they are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. And then in verse 31, the next verse, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent one, someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here, <clears throat> here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. <clears throat> so here we have a story of Jesus and his family in verses 20 and 21, and then 31 to 35. His family says that he is out of his mind because he is so busy with the crowds that he wasn't able to eat. Then they came to him and wanted to see him, and he says that those who do God's will are his family. But notice the story that is inserted into this story of his family. The scribes accuse him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And what does Jesus say? If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now, is it by chance that that was put in the story of Jesus and his family, or was it by design? Okay, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A family is what it means. A family divided against itself cannot stand. There's something to think about there. Okay. Now, there are other places in the, uh, the Gospel of Mark where uh, this kind of thing happens. And uh, I just list there the, the scripture passages, but let's go on here. The story of Jairus' daughter in uh, chapter 5. Uh, the, the father comes and asks Jesus to pray for or uh, to raise up his daughter. And then right in the middle of that, we have the story of the woman with the issue of blood. So Jesus ministers to her. And then we pick up Jairus' daughter again, that story. And it finishes. In chapter 6, we have the sending out of the 12, and then the story of John the Baptist beheaded, and then again the sending out of the 12. In chapter 9, we have teaching about the children, and then the story of the exorcist, and then again teaching about children. In chapter 11, we have the story of the fig tree, and then Jesus going to the temple. And then again, we pick up the story of the fig tree. In chapter 14, there's the plot to kill Jesus. And then the anointing at Bethany. And then again, the plot to kill Jesus. And then later in chapter 14, we have the story of Peter, uh, Peter's denial. And then Jesus before the Sanhedrin. And then again, we have the story of Peter. So we see this repeated throughout the book of Mark, this intercalation or the Mark and sandwiches, uh, where a story begins, another story is inserted, and then the first story is finished. Uh, do you have any questions or comments here? Uh, sir, uh, yes. the Markan sandwich is only unique uh, to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's as, only him. Yeah. As far as I know, it's only him. Now, there probably is some of that in the other Gospels, but it's not a recurring thing that we see all the way through the Gospels. 
that that is a uh, a characteristic of Mark. Now Johnson also shows that the Book of Mark contains three declarations that Jesus is the Son of God. In Mark 1.11, at Jesus' baptism, at the beginning of the gospel, the Father says, you are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. In Mark 9.7, at the transfiguration, in the middle of the gospel, the Father says, this is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. And in Mark 15, 39, at the end of the gospel, the Roman soldier says, surely this man was the son of God. Um, now, let me just mention another group of three. In Mark 12, 21, Jesus deals with the disciples' inability to see what he meant when he mentions the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember that story? Um, they get on the boat, and Jesus said, beware of the, the uh, bread of the, or the leaven of the Pharisees. And they think, it's because we didn't bring bread. Uh, and uh, they discussed uh, this with one another. And then it says, aware of, of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they replied, 12. And then with the, uh, the 4,000, uh, there were uh, seven, seven basketfuls. And he says, do you still not understand? And then in Mark 8, 27 to 31, we see that people don't see who Jesus is, although God reveals it to Peter. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And, of course, Peter says, you are the, uh, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, right between these stories, the stories of the disciples not perceiving what Jesus is talking about when he mentions the leaven of the Pharisees, and uh, the people not seeing who Jesus really is. Mark puts in the story of healing of the blind man. And uh, he prays for the blind man. And the blind man says, I see men as trees walking. He cannot see clearly. And then Jesus prays for him again. And he sees clearly. Now, is there any connection between these stories? Perhaps so. We have spiritual blindness by the disciples, and there's an explanation. We have physical blindness of the blind man, and then the healing, and then the spiritual blindness of the people, and the revelation, you are the Christ, the Son of God. So maybe there is a parallel there. Maybe there, again, maybe this is a Mark and Sandwich. Okay, our time is up. So we'll have to stop here. And uh, we will see you on Thursday morning. God bless you. Uh, before we go, are there any questions or comments? If, if not, we will sign off here. God bless you. God bless, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. God bless you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.